Okay, so we are going to be moving on now from the um, minutiae of looking at attaching and affixing to land, specifically using the estate interest piece of paper and registration. And now having the ability, having done that good work, to be able to look at these on a relational aspect. So we can look at the parties involved and determine how we would deal with a dispute. So as land lawyers, then our understanding of how to deal with people on the property uh, will fluctuate now looking at each dispute in turn. So that's where we're building on the information that we've already put into that foundation and starting to articulate these as individual disputes between parties. So we're looking today at the difference between a license that a lease and a license, so articulating that difference between something that is proprietary in nature and then of course the difference where it's only between the two parties and would be purely personal. So what I want to do is look at licenses first of all, so we're articulating what a license would mean in terms of a permission, so it's important for us to understand that. Um, and be able to identify that there are a range of opportunities for people to be on land, not just because they have a property interest, which has been our main focus so far. But looking at these other people that are on land, how are they there? What type of license or permission might they have to be on the land itself? Uh, and then we'll f f move on from there. So the focus primarily is on licenses within this session. And then we'll look a little bit at leases as an alternative. So if these people are on land under a license, it's going to be easier to remove them. And then looking at under leases, how that becomes a bit more of a permanent fixture. What is a lease? Then uh, articulating a difference because it will look at how they cannot affix and attach depending on whether it is actually a lease that they have. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at licenses, but actually in determining whether something is a lease or a license and where we're going in the next lecture together, we will have to really explore and determine whether it's a lease in the first instance. And we'll look at why that matters because we should always, as lawyers, have that parrot on our shoulder asking us why. We'll look at why it matters. It should be fairly obvious for at least one reason why it would matter, but we can explore that in a little bit more depth together. And then have a brief overview. I find that it's not something that we're going to cover in, in depth in this syllabus, but it's important for you all as individuals to understand the nature of the agreements that exist between a landlord and a tenant. So we'll, we'll cover that very briefly in this uh, module. So we get in Thomas and Sorrell some very antiquated language there. A dispensation or li license properly passes no interest, nor alters or transfers property in anything, but only makes an action lawful without which had been unlawful. So the unlawful action they're talking about there would be trespass. So a license is permission to be on land, therefore negating it being unlawful or trespassery in nature. However, just because it's permissive, just because they're allowing somebody to be on the land, that doesn't mean that it gives them an interest or an attachment to the thing. It doesn't give them a property interest as such. It just is this idea of a permission to be on land that without that permission would have made it trespassery. So they're not committing a trespass, they have permission, but they don't have that affixation or attachment to the thing that we've been looking at so far. So this is the key kind of juxtaposition between something that is purely personal between two parties and not the attachment as a property interest that we as land lawyers have been focusing on so far. So it doesn't create an interest or a state in the land. It does not create a tenancy. It does not create an easement. It does not create any of those burdens that can attach and affix to the land. It's just personal between the two people who have 
both given the permission and received the permission to be on the land. Uh, there isn't a need that you could have an interest in the land and we'll look at that in a moment but there isn't a need for the person who's been given the permission to have any interest in the land itself. There aren't any formalities so all along so far we've been looking for a piece of paper. Again we may have a piece of paper but we don't have any formalities because we aren't ultimately trying to affix and attach them to the thing itself. So let's look at licenses in a bit more depth then together. There are three main types that we'll recognize on this syllabus. So you'd have a bare license, which is permissive or indicative. We'll cover each of these in turn. So a bare license gives permission to be on the land. It's just that um, articulation of uh, a permission to be there for a basic need. A contractual license elevates things slightly, so that will be where there is some form of contractual need to be on the land, usually for some form of business purpose, so an employment contract or a sales contract, consumer contract, those sorts of contracts will require that people are in the commission of their job or in the commission of their consumer uh, basis, they are having to be in a place to do that. And then finally, a license that could have some form of grant of a property right. So they need to be on the land in order to take that property right. Uh, that's most specifically uh, a profit that we've looked at uh, very briefly when we're talking about easements. So a profit of prawn, something to take from the land is a property right. In order to take it from the land, you have to be able to get onto the land so that permission or that license is the ability to go on land. Again, if it becomes a right of way or it became an easement, that's a slightly different situation. So today we're going to focus on license versus lease, but when we come to easements, we'll be looking at are they easements or are they just permission to be on the land. So the person giving the license is referred to as the licensor, and the receiver of the license, the recipient of the permission, would then obviously be the licensee. So then, I suppose as land lawyers, we are knowing that if it is a license, it's not going to ultimately affix and attach to the thing in every situation. So we have to make sure that that's true. We have to see whether the licensor can revoke or withdraw that permission. What does that look like? What do they have to do in order to tell the person they're no, no longer allowed on the land? Could the licensee, so the person who has the license, could they assign that or pass that benefit over to another party and therefore bind the licensor in some way? So is it possible for somebody with permission to go on the land to pass that permission over to somebody else? And then... Is somebody who comes along to buy the land bound by the terms of this license? Does somebody who is a new purchaser of land get caught up in this relationship between licensor and licensee? Do they step in and become the new licensor in some way? So those are questions we can look at once we think about each type of license. The first type of license, the most basic one, is the bare license. The bare license being um, applicable to that bare permission to be on the land. There's no good, um, no consideration given. So no money, no contract, nothing that ties the parties together as a form of consideration has been provided. It's just freely given permission to be on the land. So it's gratuitous, it's free. It's express it's capable of being express so you would have the ability to invite somebody onto your land you can invite somebody in you can ask somebody to come onto your land and that would be an express license but also it can be implicit it can be that just by having uh, an open gate or a footpath or some form of access point that isn't a shut door that there is an implication that you don't mind people uh, 
walking on what's technically your property if you're thinking about a garden path or through a garden gate. So that it obviously then indicates that if you want to withhold that permission, you would need to make it explicit that um, through locking the gate or through signage that people would not be welcome and that people that um, would cross that threshold would be trespassers in some way. So the revocation, we can ask people to leave obviously so the ability to um, allow somebody onto our property is something that we can revoke we can ask them to leave so I might invite somebody in if it's getting late or their behavior changes I may ask them to leave and obviously then we have to allow them a reasonable amount of time to be able to do that and what's reasonable will depend on the circumstances so in Bolotti, we saw people who were in residence who had permission to use somewhere during the war to reside in and they were given a very short amount of time uh, to, to vacate the property and it was seen to be unreasonable within that time period because of the nature of their occupation they were actually living there. So what's reasonable depends on the time it takes uh, the length of hold in, in the land. So we're looking at this um, in the round. We're looking for reasonable to be allowed to be subjective in certain cases. In Robson and Hallett, for example, it was the length of time it took somebody to get to the door. So a policeman was asked to leave um, and was accosted on his way out. And the, the argument being that he was asked to leave. And the minute he was asked to leave, he became a trespasser. Um, so different threshold there of responsibilities towards somebody who's a trespasser versus somebody who is allowed to be on your land. Um, obviously without the kind of uh, police impact there of a member of state. But thinking about that uh, as, a, as a point of law, thinking about at what point somebody becomes a trespasser. And again, you have to allow reasonable time for somebody to get to the door. So after the moment that would be unreasonable, that person becomes a trespasser. So you've asked somebody to leave, you've given them a reasonable amount of time to do so, depending on their hold in the land. And after that, they would become a trespasser. They no longer have permission to stay on the land. However, some terms are deemed to not be particularly helpful if we're looking at asking somebody to leave we have to be very clear that we ask them to leave in a very direct and clear manner that relates to the property and isn't just an abusive term. So in Gillam and Bryden, Brydenbach, we see the ter that term that is written on the slide used. So a term of abuse is being used that would usually indicate that somebody uh, is required to uh, move on to another place but that's just deemed to be a term of abuse and not necessarily a, a clear uh, revocation of a bare licence. Thinking then about assigning, whether it could be assigned to somebody else, obviously it's possible to assign permission to somebody else, but then that could be revoked. So if I invite someone uh, to come and... I don't want them in my property I can obviously clearly disinvite that person or ask them to leave so the ability to assign that permission to be there can be swapped from one party to another but then I obviously as a licensor can quite easily revoke that and thinking about whether it binds anybody else coming along to buy my land, it should be fairly obvious that that sort of um, impact wouldn't be binding because it's not it's not proprietary in in nature. It's personal between the parties who have asked somebody onto the land and been invited onto the land, and that's not transferable. Escalating then when there may be some other form of evidence and also some form of consideration for the permission to be on land. 
So bear license just being this free invitation that is either express or implicit. However, as contractual licenses, we have a situation where consideration, value, um, some form of employment is given in return for the license. For example, uh, usually cu customers in a certain place, so somebody going shopping or going to the cinema or going to a movie, whenever we can all behave that way again. Um, and in situations where uh, you'd be under an employment contract or you've, you're a student and you have bought services, you would be at the university under a contract for the supply of education I would be at the university under a contract of employment so in both of our situations where we would be at ARU together we will be there as contractual licensees. Revocation again thinking about revoking that contract so can I ask you as a student to leave can the university ask me to, to leave Yes, absolutely, it can be revoked at any time. So in Wood and Leadbetter, we had a customer who was at the Doncaster Races, which was a four-day event, um, and looking at the fact that he was asked to leave at a point within those four days, would that be allowed? Well, absolutely, the contract can be revoked. You can ask somebody to leave and still be able to remove them from the land. Same way as I could ask you as a student to leave or the university could ask me as a lecturer to leave. The difference being then how that's handled in the eyes of contract law. So yes, they would become a trespasser after the moment within which they were left and again that being a reasonable amount of time to allow them to leave. And also again, depending on the nature of their hold. So in Millennium Theatre Productions in Winter Garden, we have um, a theatre company who um, have the ability to put productions on. They've gone to great lengths to have actors and actresses and um, costumes, etc. And looking at the amount of notice that they were given by the owners of the theatre to leave, and whether that was reasonable, the court said that it was in those circumstances because sufficient notice had been given um, in order to allow them to gather their belongings, etc. Um, and not to be seen to be unreasonable. So we can use the same sort of attitude as we had with Berlotti looking at the ability for the person to hold the land in a certain way, depending on how long they are there, etc. So we've got um, a month's notice there being seen to be reasonable within a six-month uh, tenancy. So we've got six month, uh, sorry, not tenancy, obviously, it's a license, a six-monthly a period of occupation of the theatre by the production company and a one month notice period to leave was seen to be reasonable. Obviously then if we're thinking about re revocation and your ability to be asked to leave we're still thinking that um, a normal contractual situation would apply so same again if I ask you to leave as a student or the employee, uh, employers ask me to leave the university property as an employer, that those normal contractual rules would apply. So there would be a situation where if it's been revoked unfairly, um, that there will be a breach. If it's been unlawful, I can request specific performance. So again, in that situation, looking at the um, revocation and the fact that somebody will have broken contract with me, I will have the usual breach of contract um, availability to me in, in the form of damages. 
and again if it would be unlawful that I could request the specific performance of my contract, i.e. to be allowed to come back to the university to teach. Uh, so that was recognised in Hearst and Picture Theatres, which was about a um, man who was ejected unfairly from a movie theatre. There was an understa a cinema. It was an understanding that he hadn't, or thought that he hadn't paid for his ticket, and they ejected the wrong person. So obviously, uh, to request specific performance in that situation, you would ask for the move to go into the cinema and sit there and watch. A movie on your own well that's not going to happen in the sort of contracts that I've explained a student contract or the employment contract it could potentially happen that I could ask for a specific performance and ask to return to my place of work um, but it, it doesn't it's equitable so it doesn't have to happen we're not looking at a property right here where we can definitely affix and attach somebody to the land we're looking at it as a range of remedies knowing that breach of contract, the first remedy is always damages. So again, thinking about assignment, is it possible for me to pass the ability to be on the land over to another? Again, understanding that that would usually only be possible if it's permitted under the contractual rules. So that would be quite rare if you're thinking about consumer rules where you were as a student paying for your education, could you pass that some over to somebody else? Very unlikely, in fact, no. Uh, could I ask somebody else to come along and teach you? No. So assignment of the ability to be in that place would be restricted by the terms of our contract and our exclusivity. And thinking about what the effect would be on the third party. So, so somebody coming along to buy land get bound up by the fact. So say, for example, Anglia Ruskin wanted to sell uh, one of their buildings in either Cambridge or Chelmsford. Would somebody coming along to buy that be bound by us? Would they be bound by those contractual licences? And again, we have... Uh, we had some confusion uh, in the law, but this is um, cleared up in a case that we're going to come back to again in the next lecture when we're looking at whether something is a license or a lease. This is cleared up in Ashburn Anstalt and Arnold where it said no, it doesn't become binding on future parties because in that situation the person just has a contractual license and the remedy, as we've already stated, would be for breach against the party to whom they are bound and under contract law. It doesn't bind them to land in any way and therefore it doesn't affix and attach them against a new purchaser. So if there's any um, revocation, they have to be removed from the land, they have to seek breach of damage, breach of, breach of contract through the first party, usually damages, uh, but th that won't be binding upon the person coming along to take over. So therefore contractual license cannot be and is not proprietary in some way, it still will not affix and attach somebody to the land, which is key to us with where we're heading in terms of thinking about whether something is a lease or a license. We know that the holder of a lease has a proprietary interest in land and the ho a license holder, even if they have a contractual license, does not and cannot bind future purchasers. So the third form of license that we're going to cover very briefly is a license coupled with a grant and that is that notion of uh, somebody who has been given a right over the property on the land and in order to exercise that right they have to enter the land in order to take it. So the rights to fish or hunt or gather wood or um, fruit or milk or any of that stuff that could come from land or from animals on land. That proprietary right, that profit à prendre that we've um, discussed very briefly before, in order to benefit from that right, they have to get onto land in order to get it. They could be getting onto the land as an easement and that's what we'll look at when we come to easements. But right now we're thinking about them just having permission to do that.
it's recognised in Hounslow that um, the person who has that has a higher form of right because they do have an interest in land in addition to their permission to be on land. So they do have already a proprietary right and that was recognised um, in that case as regards the ability to go on land to take down trees. So the removal of trees, the taking of the trees um, was seen to be the proprietary right that allowed then for the licence to kick in. You have to allow somebody onto the land in order to benefit from the proprietary right. So it, it's, it's, it's a, again a higher level. The powers of that mean that it's not possible to revoke it if that person still has that proprietary right. If the person still has that profit à prendre that has been protected, it cannot be revoked, therefore, that they can't go get it. So if they have the right to gather the thing or take the thing from the land, then you have to allow somebody access to go get the thing and take it from the land. Uh, looking at the assigning of the profit, uh, the thing itself, so the benefit of the, the profit can be assigned to another party. So it is possible to allow somebody else to um, gather the wood or the, if you're thinking about it as an easement, for example, that right of way, that right of way would transfer across to other parties. So that benefit of taking something from the land can also transfer across to other parties. And the effect, therefore, on a third party, so a new purchaser coming along to land, would be, again, that the profit itself is a proprietary interest. It's registrable. It can be entered at land registry for the world at large to see, as we already know. And if it's been done that in that way and it's protected, it will bind a future purchaser. And again, in order for them to be able to take the thing, they have to be able to get onto land in order to take it so that access will become um, attached and affixed as well. If they can go get the thing they have to be able to go get onto land to go get it. So that's the only form of license that would be a bit higher than the other two, a lot higher than the other two because there is this ability to go onto land and take something. So when we're thinking about whether there may be a license, we can look at a few examples here. You walk up a neighbour's garden path to deliver a letter. Thinking about what type of license that is, that's going to just be permissive at best and some sort of implicit permission just by the existence of a path that isn't gated or um, hasn't got a dog or a sign saying do not enter. So the implicit nature of that ability to walk up my neighbour's garden path is a bare licence. It's an implied bare licence. Your best friend invites you round to watch a movie and to have a glass of wine. Again, we have permission there given from one party to another to enter a property. There's no consideration, so there's no exchange of money it's not a consumer there's no contract there so again we would have a bare license and there's been an express invitation so that would be an express bare license thinking about the revocability of that so we looked at how the neighbor could revoke or exclude with uh, the garden path can ask you to leave obviously but um, could even have prohibited you your entry at the outset with a signage or a gate or something locked. Uh, with this one, you, the express invitation would have to be revoked in some way, so you'd have to ask somebody to leave. Um, and again, at that point of asking them to leave, they would become a trespasser. Thinking also about some of those cases like Robson and Hallett and Berlotti, as to what would be a reasonable amount of time to allow that person to leave.
going shopping in a local shopping mall and in the evening going out to see a film. In both of those situations you will be there under some form of license. Now your ability to go into the mall will probably be an implied bare license. It would be implied that because the mall is open and you can access it and they're not, they're not barring you in any way that you have an implied bare license. Obviously then while you're within specific shops if you're spending your money you have a contractual license with that uh, one vendor but ultimately you're still kind of perusing the shops under your bare license, your bare permission to be there. If then in the evening you go to a cinema your um, attendance in the uh, at the film in the movie theatre is contractual you have a contractual license it can be revoked you can be asked to leave and if it's revoked you will have to kind of take it up as a breach of contract issue if you haven't uh, you know wronged them in any way you go to your job in a local supermarket and hang out there after work okay so while you're under employment so in your place of work while you're under employment you will be there under a contractual license you will have the ability to perform your job within your place of work but after your hours of work depending on where you are obviously as well you may have to leave certain areas after at the moment your job is complete and then go out into common areas within the um, supermarket where other customers could be there as contractual licensees or bare licensees. Um, however, you may have the ability or permission to stay on after work and therefore translate from having a contractual license under your employment to having a bare license to just have permission to be in a certain place. You cross your neighbour's farm to pick their strawberries. Again, if that's a profit, if that's something that you have permission to do and is an enshrined property right that you have uh, protected at land registry, you have the right to take strawberries from that farm, then your crossing of your neighbour's farm in order to get those strawberries would be a licence coupled with a grant. You've got permission to take something and in order to take that thing, you have to access the farm. Uh, so that's that could be a way of looking at that one. Otherwise, if it's just that your neighbour lets you go get strawberries and it, all of it's permissive, then it's going to be a bare licence. If <laughs> it's a pick-your-own-strawberries farm and you're paying for the strawberries, it's going to be a contractual licence. So you can see in that end scenario there are three different possibilities really. So moving away from licences and starting to think about when something might be a lease, we'll look at the terminology first and we should be reasonably comfortable with some of this. We know that a term of year is absolute under section 11 b of the Law of Property Act 1925 is our recognition for that which is a leasehold a tenancy therefore becoming a lease and our landlord being the person who gives the lease the lessor. We would then have a tenant being given the lease, the lessee. So same way you've got licensor and licensee we would have in this relationship a lessor and a lessee. So none of that should be a huge surprise. We then have what's called the freehold reversion. That's the ability for the freehold to revert back to the landlord at the end of the lease. So that's that idea that during the term of years absolute, the tenant has the absolute hold over the land, but that that will revert back to the freeholder or the fee simple absolute and possession holder at the end of that lease it reverts back to them they regain complete control over their own land they don't have any tenant that they're bound by so freehold reversion is where the tenancy is at an end 
and the freeholder reverts back to being the true owner without any other absolute recognition of power over them. Assignment would be the ability for the tenant to assign their lease to another. So that's the passing of the lease onto a different tenant. That may or may not be allowed under the terms of your lease. So that's something to look at and consider within each specific um, tenancy agreement. Is it possible to assign a lease? Uh, so for example, I have a business lease. Uh, my business lease is five years long and um, I actually have taken over the lease from somebody else because I've been in business a year and a half. Um, they had already been in business for a year when I took it over. So I only have two and a half years left on my lease of my business. Um, but the lease was five years in length. One year with the first tenant who then assigned it over to me and I've been there a year and a half so I have two and a half years left to run of a five year lease. That's what assignment does. And that's different from creating a sublease. So a sublease would be again if I'd been allowed to let rent it from him. My previous uh, the previous tenant might not be able to assign it to me, they might not be able to make me the new tenant and pass the lease to me, but they may be able to create a sublease where they sublet it out, either in its entirety or as a part. So they may be able to sublet the whole thing out. Maybe they want to make a few pounds and they think the lease is quite um, small in terms of an amount. So if the lease <clears throat> was £750 a month and they wanted to sublet it to me for £900 a month, they would have a way of making themselves a very quick £150 a month just by subletting. The other thing they might be doing is they may be renting out a large property and it's uh, in their interest therefore to carve it out into sub-tenancies to maximise it. So they will rent some of it out for 500 some of it out for 250 and cover the £750 rent that way. So sublet is the ability to create a tenancy under you as the tenant. Assignment is the passing from one tenant to another. This is going to be really important with where we're going next in terms of looking at whether something is a lease and what a lease looks like. We have to be able to identify the core characteristics of a lease and that's our starting point for the next lecture. What a lease looks like and is means that the tenant has exclusivity of possession and this is a case that we're going to explore in great detail. <clears throat> the case of Street and Mountford where exclusivity of possession is dealt with at length. What does it look like as a tenant to be able to exclude the world at large, including the landlord? Because every landlord has a set of keys or has an agent or there may be rules around how you use space and who's allowed in there. So what does exclusivity of possession look like under a tenancy? We will have to look at that in more detail but the idea being that the uh, tenant exclusively possesses the land can um, exclude all others the world at large including the landlord. We've already established that a term of years absolute has to have a term of years so we have to have a term that is certain and we looked at the case of Lace and Chandler which established that the duration of the war was not seen to be sufficiently certain that the war could go on um, ad nauseum. You could have a very, very long war. You could have a very, very short war. Same with any concepts of summer or winter or uh, while you're at university. Anything like that would be deemed to be uncertain. Rent is stipulated as being needed under Section 205 of the Law of Property Act 1925 as one of the key characteristics of when you will find a term of years absolute for a fixed term with payment of rent is how, is it, how it's referred to. So we have statutory authority for the fact that ideally we would be looking for rent and this was considered in Street and Mountford. However, we have an updated authority for the fact that 
rent is only indicative as to whether there is a lease in Skipton Building Society in Clayton. So Skipton um, is one of these unusual situations where although we have a statutory authority that states that we should really be looking for rent, we then have a case that says that it's not always indicative of a landlord-tenant relationship. Bearing in mind, under contractual licences, people can still be paying money to be somewhere. So you can have a contractual licence to have a hotel room, to have an Airbnb, to stay in a shelter, all of these situations where people might be paying money to be somewhere. Does that then translate them purely into being a tenant or does that require more interrogation? And again, Skipton Building Society in Clayton said that rent wasn't sufficient, that our core factor really is exclusive possession, which is why we're going to look at it in more depth together in the next lecture. So then just very briefly to touch on uh, why this matters, because we'll be coming through that in the lecture itself. Obviously, it matters because in terms of tenure, as a property interest, a leasehold will affix and attach people to land. So it will make sure that they are secure it's as a tenant, that they cannot be asked to leave. They affix and attach to the thing and they are non-movable immovable objects against a third party or new purchaser whereas we know if it's a contractual license if they're paying money in order to be there and they're removable it's revocable then their only standing will be damages or an argument around specific performance but all of that being a blur of contractual personal stuff and not property law matter in terms as a tenant they will have a uh, high standing in terms of landlord and tenant law as to how the landlord has to protect them when it comes to repair but also thinking about contractual situations where if you go into a hotel room and it's not to standard you will have a different amount of hold so that's not always again necessarily beneficial because the basic rights of landlord and tenant would be things like running water and a flushable toilet and um, it's at a certain temperature whereas whenever you go to a hotel you do expect a little bit more than there are no rats and there's running water so uh, repairing obligations again helpful for landlord tenant and making certain things happen but also not necessarily exclusive to you not requiring certain standards in terms of accommodation <laughs> Also, as a tenant, it may help you to take an action in nuisance or in trespass because you have rights then in tort as the holder of a property interest to protect the property because you affix and attach and have that standing in tort to recognise that. So that's something we can look at. If you look at Hunter and Canary Wharf, that action was taken by tenants of the properties involved. Okay, very briefly touching on leasehold covenants. Leasehold covenants are the covenants that are made, the promises made bef between landlord and tenant. They can be expressly put in, in writing uh, between the landlord and tenant or they can be implied and they cover things like the landlord's promises to allow the tenant to quietly enjoy the property. Obviously you don't want your landlord in and out so there is um, a kind of implied sense that the landlord will leave the tenant to it. Uh, not to derogate from that grant, so not to disallow the ability for the tenant to use the property in the way to which it's planned. This usually applies to uh, commercial contracts, so commercial tenancies. Alden is about a situation where somebody was using sheds for drying wood and there was uh, needed a certain amount of airflow, the landlord has rented the property out on the understanding that it's going to be used for that purpose, but then built property next to it, or constructed buildings next to it, that decreased the airflow. So therefore not allowing the tenant the ability to use the property in the way that which they had planned and would, would be the core of their business. 
So the landlord has, again, implicitly understood the purpose for which the tenant has taken the property and should allow them to be able to behave that way. Again, under Section 11 of the Landlords and Tenant Act 1985, the landlord will have those basic rights of repair and maintenance, and they are seen to be quite a low threshold, as I said, in terms of what exactly they have to do. They are seen to be quite minimal. The tenant, then, obviously, the main one that they have to do is to pay rent, but there may be others, obviously, in terms of how they have to keep the property um, and their behaviours in terms of who can or can't come in, whether they can have pets, whether there are children allowed um, and whether they can paint, etc. There may be covenants around those sorts of behaviours as well. And obviously the things that we've looked at before, so whether it's possible for them to pass the lease over to another party, to assign it elsewhere or to sublet it. And that can that permission can be qualified. So yes, you can, but we're going to credit check them, or it can be absolute. No, you can't. So, uh, looking at, at whether it's it's allowed or allowed under certain conditions. In terms then of how the landlord behaves as regards non-payment of rent, the landlord obviously has the right to sue for the rent. The landlord could see the um, contract as forfeit and ask for the return of the property. So is there a clause within the lease that indicates how the parties behave? If that happens, usually the landlord will give some form of notice that he would like, he or she would like the tenant to vacate. There uh, may be under section 6 of the Criminal Law Act 1977 the ability for the um, landlord to seek uh, re-entry, uh, so apply for a court order and again um, re-enter the property in order to take it back. And those are the most serious ones. So uh, the other one being distress, so they can distress against um, items of the tenants, so the way they, they take re-entry as a route, they could potentially then seize items that were left behind. Um, or seize an items um, and exclude the tenant. So you'll see that on these programs like Camp Pay will take it away, where a bailiff can turn up um, or a magistrate of court can turn up and uh, change the locks, keep all possessions internally uh, and use it to offset some of the debt. <laughs> Other breaches that would not be so serious uh, that uh, usually relate to how the property has been treated or handled there may be damages allowable under section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act for items that have been um, or, or damage done to the property. Specific performance may require that um, the property is put back how it was found so there, or there may be some form of um, understanding that holes have to be filled uh, or work has to be paid for, carpets have to re be replaced etc. Uh, there's Leasehold Properties Repairs Act, which again sets out terms under which a tenant should uh, conduct repairs if they're at fault, so work on toilet seats, etc. Forfeiture would be the most extreme, so again this idea that any behaviours like that might cause uh, a forfeit of the entire lease itself under the terms and conditions of that lease. And in that case, the landlord would have to serve as what's called a section 146 notice uh, that the tenancy has been broken in that way and that they are, are, are giving notice for the, the uh, tenant to leave under those conditions. Tenants remedies are few and far between, obviously, because they are the ones being burdened by uh, the need to behave in, in more ways than the other. Uh, so basically, unless there is some form of harassment or wrongful eviction, uh, the tenant may have action under Section 1 of the Protection from Eviction Act 1977, but that would have to be pretty extreme. Uh, if the landlord isn't keeping up with their quite basic requirements to repair and maintain, 
there are options to deduct from the rent but those are quite stringent and it's worth looking at the shelter website as to when you could actually behave that way because obviously failure to pay rent means that you could be um, evicted so that's a very uh, dangerous route to go down it's uh, it actually uh, is very heavily prescribed in shelter uh, on the shelter website that you don't behave that way uh, that it, it and then it prescribes how you could justify it by sending the landlord a letter saying that that's what you're about to do uh, getting three quotes for the job sending those to the landlord then saying telling the landlord that you're going to get it done etc so that there's a prescriptive approach to do rather than just kind of getting someone to do it and taking it out of the rent otherwise you could be seen to have forfeited your lease uh, or specific performance so that's again where you'd have to apply under section 17 uh, to court to say that there has been a failure and that you want the landlord to put it right and that's what they they have to do under the contract so what I wanted to do is look at the types of licenses that we've got understanding that the fact that we're doing that is to establish that a license is different from a proprietary hold in land those types of licenses also escalating, uh, but still being distinguishable from what we would recognise as a lease. Knowing that where we're headed in the next lecture is to um, explore this in more depth as to how do we affix and attach somebody to the land under a tenancy versus the situation where they may be paying to be somewhere. And that's where we're headed next. Why it matters, obviously, is that idea of tenure or security that they can affix and attach to the land. They can ask the landlord to repair and maintain, and it gives them standing in other areas of law, too. Um, we've briefly, just kind of for your own information, had a look at covenants that exist between a landlord and tenant for the protection of both parties. Thank you.